Reeves National Forest near Heber, Arizona. At the end of the day, on the drive back home, Travis noticed a bright light coming through the trees. When the men got closer, they saw that it was, quote, a strange golden disc, end quote, hovering stationary about 20 feet off the ground with a 15 to 20 foot diameter and eight to 10 foot width. Though his coworkers warned that he should stay away, Travis approached the craft, hearing loud vibrations as the craft began spinning erratically. Suddenly, a blue-green light sprung from the craft, striking Travis in the chest and head, catapulting him backwards several feet, end quote. Having witnessed this, Travis's friends fled the scene, assuming Travis to be dead. In their retreat, one of the men observed the saucer fly up to the top of the trees and away to the northeast. Some of the men returned to the scene out of guilt, only to find that Travis was no longer there. According to Travis's own writing about the experience, Travis awoke in what appeared to be a medical office or lab with a triangular ceiling among three humanoid beings with large brown eyes and abnormally large heads. They stood under five feet tall and were wearing soft, billowy orange-brown overalls. Travis attacked the three beings, who then retreated. As Travis explored other rooms in an attempt to escape, he encountered a large, muscular man wearing a helmet, who forced him out of the craft into a warehouse with other saucers, eventually leading him into another room with three more people, all very good-looking. Quote, two men and a woman were standing around the table. They were all wearing velvety blue uniforms like the first man's, except that they had no helmets. The two men had the same muscularity and the same masculine good looks as the first man. The woman also had a face and figure that was the epitome of her gender. They were smooth skinned and blemishless. No moles, freckles, wrinkles, or scars marked their skin. The striking good looks of the man I had first met became more obvious on seeing them all together. They shared a family-like resemblance, although they were not identical." End quote. These people gently pushed him onto a table and put a mask over his mouth and nose, at which point Travis passed out. The next thing Travis knew, he was lying on the ground in Heber, Arizona. He saw a silvery disc-shaped craft hovering above the road near him, which then flew straight up into the sky and disappeared silently. Although he only believed he was gone for an hour or an hour and a half, he later learned he had been missing for five days. Over this period of five days, the rest of Travis's crew came under investigation for Travis's disappearance. During this investigation, the suspects underwent psychiatric testing and polygraphs, during which none of the men confessed to faking the abduction. All of the later lie detector tests administered to Travis and the other witnesses came back as passing or inconclusive. A psychiatrist suspected that the entire abduction was in Travis's imagination, but could not explain why the others went along with it. In a recent HuffPost Weird News podcast, Travis said, quote, about 15 years later, it was discovered that the trees nearest to where the UFO hovered had been producing wood fiber at 36 times the rate it had been in the 85 years before that. A complete core sampling revealed that this thickened growth was only on the side of the trees towards or in the direction that the craft had been." End quote. As if this case couldn't get any more bizarre, Travis appeared on Fox's Moment of Truth game show, where a polygraph was conducted on stage. This particular polygraph determined that he was not telling the truth about his abduction. Regardless, Travis maintains that the events transpired as he has told them. The second case is the abduction of Linda Napolitano. UFOologist Bud Hopkins worked closely with Linda to document and publicize her case. On November 30th, 1989, around 3.15 a.m. in New York City, Linda Napolitano claimed she awoke to find short aliens around her bed. She found herself unable to wake up her husband as she perceived the beings to be telling her to be quiet in an odd language. The three beings then levitated her outside her 12th story apartment window, floating in a blue-white light up into a clamshell-shaped spaceship. Once inside, the beings experimented on her, including putting an instrument inside her nose. After, she woke up nearly two hours later at 5 a.m. next to her husband in bed. 
In 1991, two years after the abduction, Linda reached out to Hopkins with an X-ray of her nose showing a cylindrical object that Hopkins describes as having, quote, spiraling extensions that curl out away from her face, end quote. The X-ray was taken by podiatric surgeon and Linda's niece, Lisa Bayer. Shortly after, Linda claimed the object was removed during another abduction. Hopkins reports that Linda visited a nose and throat specialist who confirmed the object was gone. A conspicuous ridge of built-up cartilage showed where it had once been embedded. These details are somewhat common among abduction tales, but what makes this case famous are the supposed witnesses to the event. In 1991, nearly two years after Linda's abduction, Hopkins received a letter from a police officer detailing an experience with his partner in November 1989. The two were sitting underneath the FDR bridge when they saw a blue light with a woman being levitated alongside three strange beings as they made their way into the light. They reportedly felt guilty for not helping the woman and one officer had a nervous breakdown, spending nights parked underneath her building. Hopkins told Linda not to speak with the officers if they reached out to her to avoid contaminating their accounts. Unfortunately, the two visited Linda multiple times on their own volition revealing their names to be Richard and Dan, looking for answers about what they saw that night. Linda directed them to Hopkins, and in a few weeks, Hopkins received a letter. This letter revealed that the two officers were actually bodyguards on a security detail for, quote, an important political figure, end quote. This political figure, who was also present with the two bodyguards during the abduction, also signed the letter, albeit under the moniker, him. Some UFOologists believe this figure is the former Secretary General of the UN, Javier Perez de Quilar. However, while this seems impressive in terms of proof, it should be noted that Hopkins never physically met with Richard and Dan, and only corresponded via letters. This has led many to believe that Hopkins was the victim of a hoax, where either Linda made up Richard and Dan alone, or Linda and a group of people coordinated to complete the hoax. One takedown of the story in the book, The Trickster and the Paranormal, cites a person who formerly served in Dignitary Protective Services, who explained that details of the night of the abduction provided by Richard and Dan didn't line up with security protocol for moving officials. Still, according to Sean F. Mears, a UFO and alien abduction researcher who worked with Hopkins, there are 23 witnesses on the public record, ranging from family and friends to complete strangers. Three of these strangers worked at the nearby New York Post, one of whom was an investigative reporter named Steve Dunleavy. Despite the questioned credibility of the two main witnesses, Linda maintains the truth lies in all the witnesses. She has said, quote, if I was hallucinating, then the witnesses saw my hallucination. That sounds crazier than the whole abduction phenomenon, end quote. The third case is the abduction of Frederick Valentich. This case is a little different from the others in that the abducted person never returned. On October 21st, 1978, at 6.19 p.m., instructor pilot Frederick Valentich began the flight from Moorabbin Airport in Victoria, Australia to King Island, Tasmania over the Bass Strait in a Cessna 182L. His destination was only about an hour away. Visibility was good and there were only light winds. Valentich, 20 years old at the time, reportedly wanted to get more flight hours in. Valentich made contact with Steve Roby at air traffic control in Melbourne between 7.06 and 7.12 p.m. During the transmission, Valentich asked whether there was any known aircraft in his area. After air traffic control said there was not, Valentich claimed a large unknown aircraft was flying about 1,000 feet above him at a fast speed with four bright lights. Valentich then reportedly said, quote, it seems to be playing some sort of game. He's flying over me. It's not an aircraft, end quote. He continued to describe the craft saying, quote, it seems like it's stationary. What I'm doing right now is orbiting and the thing is just orbiting on top of me. Also, it's got a green light and sort of metallic. It's shiny on the outside. It's just vanished, end quote. His last message around 7.12 p.m. to air traffic control was, quote, uh, Melbourne, that strange aircraft is hovering on top of me again. It is hovering and it's not an aircraft, end quote. After 17 seconds of silence, 
there was a loud sound of metal scraping. Authorities are said to have searched the area for four days, but found nothing, and Valentich was never seen again. The reason for the disappearance of the aircraft has not been determined." End quote. A. Woodward, the man who signed off on the report, offered pure, unfiltered speculation that Valentich could have been disoriented, suicidal, or even the victim of a meteorite crash. One alternate theory comes from a feature story in a 2013 issue of Skeptical Inquirer. The story mentions that Valentich was inexperienced as a pilot and had supposedly been sighted twice for deliberately flying blind into a cloud. According to another source, Valentich was reportedly fascinated with UFOs and even had a UFO scrapbook with him when he disappeared. The publication Skeptical Inquirer posits that Valentich's experience was some mixture of wanting to see something, being easily led to believe that anything he didn't recognize was a UFO, becoming disoriented, and or mistaking stars and the Cessna's own lights as lights from another object. However, it should be mentioned that other sources contest that Valentich was an experienced pilot. It's also worth noting that the Cessna 182 planes were designed to float in the case of a water landing. Historian Reg Watson has also found numerous reports of UFO sightings, including reports of cigar-shaped lights seen near King Island, Australia for two months prior to Valentich's disappearance. A farmer allegedly saw a craft flying over his land near Adelaide the morning after Valentich vanished. He claimed that Valentich's plane was stuck to the side of the craft. Furthermore, one of the last pieces of information on record was Valentich reaching Cape Otway at 7 p.m. Here's a photograph taken off Cape Otway 20 minutes before Valentich vanished that shows a strange shape 